Psalm 91, we're going to just kind of walk through this chapter. And this is, this is just a very amazing chapter. I'm sure you've probably read through it. In fact, there's actually a song that takes all these words and puts them to music. And uh, it's one of my favorite songs. Um, and it's just a, a precious, precious chapter. And uh, really, if I could title this, it would be the, the, the Walk with the Lord or Abiding in the Lord. And that's really what this, this is about, is abiding in, in the Lord God and, and having our trust in Him. And really, as we were just even talking about, just a, having a crazy week, having a stressful week, or having uh, crazy situations come upon us and the stresses of life, they oftentimes will bring us to a point of frustration uh, or even just, I mean, even had a physical manifestation, even headache or something to that effect. And we oftentimes take our eyes off the Lord. Our joy is diminished. Even things like depression can start to come upon us. But when we look to the Lord as our focus and our strength and we abide in Him and we rest in Him and we walk in obedience to Him, it's amazing what happens. And this, this chapter really describes that well. As we as believers, it's imperative that we abide in the Lord. In fact, Jesus told us, and we'll look at that in a moment, in John 15, that we are to abide in Him. It's not just that it's an option, it's an imperative. When we're not doing that, we're sinning, and it brings us ultimately to trouble. Trouble upon trouble comes upon us when we're not abiding in the Lord. Now, just a couple notes on the context. If you look at the beginning, right before verse 1, there's no... No little, usually a lot of these psalms, in fact, if you look over at Psalm 92, it'll say, uh, it says a psalm for the, uh, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. Uh, and a bunch of other psalms that were written by uh, David would have that little title at the beginning, or the psalms that were written by the sons of Korah would also have that little title. But this one doesn't. We don't know who wrote this psalm. I mean, obviously it's scripture, we know that, but we're not sure really the context of who wrote it or, or what was going on in their life at that time. It's clear, though, that they're expressing their absolute dependence upon God, their absolute dependence upon Him, and their trust in Him, their abiding in Him. In fact, it uses that word there in verse 1, which we'll see. So let's do that. Let's start at verse 1, and we'll just go down to verse 16. He says, beginning, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, he uses two phrases there, the shelter and the shadow or two words, I should say, the shelter of the Most High and the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, you're near Him. You can't be in something's shadow if you're not near it. If you're a long way away from it, you cannot be in its shadow. And it's obviously, with the shelter, if you're taking shelter in something, you've got to be under it. And so this occurs with the idea that we've got to be near to the Lord and under His authority. The two things. We need to submit ourselves to the Lord's authority. In fact, Jesus said in, in, um, in Luke 9 that we are to deny ourselves and take up our crosses daily and come after Him. You know, brethren, I have found in my life as a believer the thing that has given me so much joy and has increased my, uh, my contentment and my thankfulness has been the grace, and I say the grace, of self-denial. That in the Christian life, we are submitting our, it's a process of submitting one's life to the authority of Christ. In fact, there was a, a big movement back in the, the 90s. Uh, it was called the Lordship Controversy. Basically what happened was a bunch of fundamental, uh, kind of what we would say King James only, a lot of, a lot of those uh, circles came about and they said, well, you can accept Jesus as your Savior, but you don't have to accept him as your Lord, and you can still be saved. And that just comes later. And uh, I mean, obviously that's, that's just a, a profound heresy on many levels, I mean, you don't pick and choose the parts of Jesus you like. It's like saying you, you, you pick Jesus as your financial advisor, but not your, not your king. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's like, it's like, you know, going to, I mean, imagine you saying that to your spouse. You know, I pick you as my, uh, my sex partner, but really I don't care anything else about you. <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous. It, it, it's, it's actually a, a usury of that person is what it is, and abuse. And so it's basically exactly what they were saying. But Scripture paints a different picture. In other words, if you're going to be saved, you've got to submit to the Lordship of Christ. But that's the beginning of a process. That's the beginning of a lifelong endeavor. Our lives as believers can be summarized in a constant and further and greater submission to Christ's Lordship. In fact, Jesus said in, in, uh, in John 13, he said, if we love him, we keep his commandments. That, that's, the, that's the evidence of our being saved. The evidence of our being converted 
And it's something that we strive toward. We strive toward further obedience. And how do we do that? How do we draw near to the Lord? How do we abide in His, in His, in His, uh, in His shadow? How are we near to Him in that way? It's the, like I said, self denial, and it's the disciplines. In fact, theologians call disciplines in the Christian life, they call them means of grace. Means of grace. And it simply means this, is God is willing to dispense grace upon us. He is willing to give us grace as believers. But we have to use the means of grace to receive that. We have to grab hold of, those, of that grace that God is willing to give us. And how we do that is we use the means of grace. So, uh, I mean, one of the means of grace is prayer. Okay, that's one of them. We are to pray. As believers, we are to be prayerful. Pray at all times in the Spirit, Scripture says. Uh, even, even the idea, uh, Scripture talks about private prayer, you know, in the morning or in the evening. You know, set aside time in the day to, to, to be alone with the Lord. These are, these are uh, one of the ways in which we would receive God's grace into our lives. I mean, brethren, have you ever regretted spending too much time in prayer? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I just cannot, I spent way too much time in prayer, you know? Like, mm, no. Absolutely not. It's because why? It's a means of grace. We receive more grace. When we do those disciplines, they are disciplines in the fact that we have to deny the flesh. The flesh is screaming out. I mean, uh, I, I, in the morning when my alarm goes off, it's, it's like the, the, the flesh is screaming, you know, go back to bed. And, but I know that if I discipline myself and I, and I deny that and I go and read Scripture and pray and, and spend that time with the Lord in the morning, that will benefit me. And it always does. It's not, I, I never get to, I never, after that time, I never think, man, I wish I had stayed in bed. <laughs> I mean, that's what, because it is a means of grace. We receive grace. We receive further holiness. We are conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, another discipline uh, is study the Word. We're to study the Word of God. We're to know it. We're to memorize it. In fact, the Psalms even talks about in Psalm 119 that we are what? To hide God's Word in our hearts. What's the reason? So that we might not sin against God. That we might not walk away from His grace, but instead that we might receive more of it. I could go on and on. I mean, another discipline of grace would be evangelism. Um, coming here to church, this is, this is a corporate fellowship. This is a means of grace because, again, I mean, have you ever gone to church and, if it was a good church at least, you, you know, walk away saying, man, I really wish I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have gone today. That was a waste of my time. Albeit if it was a, a good service and good preaching, etc. I mean, no one's, no one's going to say that. A genuine believer is not going to say that. I've never left here a Sunday thinking, man, I really wish I hadn't showed up. I mean, that would be ridiculous. This is so edifying. It is, it is so strengthening to our souls. Oftentimes we are tempted by the flesh to live for the flesh. To live for the passions of the flesh. Food, whatever it may be. Pleasure, watching television, all these things. Nothing's wrong with those things inherently. But the flesh wants us to do those things rather than the means of grace. In fact, at the end of my life, I already know I'm going to look back um, however long I live and I'm going to regret the time that I wasted indulging the flesh rather than regret the time I used for the Spirit, you know, the things of the Spirit. I'm not going to, I mean, I know that. And, I, and you can ask any man of God that, especially men who have, I'm sure, who have lived a while and who have walked with the Lord for some time and are nearing the end of their lives. You just ask them, what are your regrets? And they start telling you, and they're all things of the flesh. And you talk about, well, what are the things you're so glad that happened? Well, they talk about how they live for the Lord, and they, they did this and that, and they disciplined themselves, and they, they uh, started spending time in prayer and diligent study of the Word. All that, it, it brings about something glorious, and that's nearness to God. That's nearness. That's abiding in His shadow. That's just an incredible thing. Nearness to the Creator. Like, what more are we pursuing? We're, we're pursuing nearness to God. But it's not a nearness that's apart from knowledge. I, I I despise really when Christians say something to the effect of, uh, I mean, yeah, I love God, I love Jesus, I love to worship God, but I'm just not big into theology, I'm just not big into studying, I'm not into all that. It, it, it's ridiculous, because what they're saying is, well, in order to really worship God, you've just got to be stupid. You've just got to be ignorant of what Scripture says about God and how God's character is portrayed in Scripture. You've just got to be ignorant if you really want to worship God truly. But actually, Scripture says the exact opposite. Jesus said that the true worshipers of God worship in spirit and in truth. How do we worship in truth? We have to study truth. We have to know truth. In fact, Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And in the context, he was speaking specifically of salvation. But you can make an argument that that's also talking about the Christian life. That we are, we are walking in freedom from sin by knowing the truth. In fact, God commands us what? To love him with our minds. 
the greater the theology, the greater the doxology. The greater our understanding of who God is, the greater our worship of God. The greater is our exaltation of God. If you have a low understanding and a low view of God, guess what? Your worship is going to be low and it's going to be weak. It's going to be very, uh, very immature. The higher your understanding of who God is and the more you know about him, the more you worship him. In fact, you can ask, you can ask people who are married, and, and you guys are married, so you, you probably could testify to this, that, that during that uh, dating process or even into your engagement, even in your marriage, as you learn more about one another, you just love one another more. You just grew in your love toward one another. And it's the same way with our God. We grow in our love for the Almighty, in our knowledge of Him, and in our knowledge of His truth. That's how we grow in our love for God. So listen to what he says in verse 2. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Why? How could he say that? Again, going back to verse 1, that's why. In verse 3 he says, For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. So he's saying now, okay, you abide in God. He is going to deliver you. Now, a prosperity preacher would come up to a text like this and say, well, yeah, any problem you have in your life, whatever it is, bad marriage, having a problem with your job, being stressed, okay, well, just draw near to God, and your life will just be easier. That's not what the text is saying. It's referring to our battle with sin. See, that's what you hear, you know, you don't hear, I should say. You don't hear referenced in a lot of prosperity circles. In fact, probably seldom ever spoken is a three-letter word called sin. You don't hear that spoken a lot. But that is what God is promising to rescue us from. When we draw near to God, when we are walking with the Lord, when we are abiding in Christ, we are being pulled away from sin. We are being pulled away from this world. I think, I think the more and more Christians see the way our culture is going especially, they're just disgusted. They're absolutely disgusting. And that's good. They should be. But how, do, you want to be, do you want to be uninfluenced from that? Do you want to be pulled away from that? Draw near to God. Draw near to Him. In fact, if you'll go with me to, to John 15 really quickly. Because Jesus, in effect, says the same thing here in John 15. Really, you could say this is almost a reference back to this, this psalm. Indirectly, of course. But the same concept is spoken. In John 15, Jesus says at the Last Supper... To his, to his disciples. I am, this is verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. How true that is. Go, think about the times in your life as a believer where you have been most dry and you have been most in rebellion or you have been most uh, further away from the Lord than you've ever been. It's when, because you're not abiding in Christ. When you're fruitless and you feel as if you're just dry, you're in the desert. It's because you're not abiding in Him. Verse 5, I am, the, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's astounding. He says much fruit. He doesn't say a little bit. He doesn't say some, much. The promise is if you abide in Christ, you will bear much fruit. And what fruit? Well, what have we been going through these past few weeks? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Perhaps as I've been preaching through these fruits, you, you, you look at them and you say, well, I mean, I see that in my life, but I just want more. I want more gentleness. I want, I want more uh, goodness. I want more kindness. I want more love toward God and fellow man. Well, then abide in Christ, and those fruits will be born in you. In fact, go down to verse 7. Look at what he says here in verse 7. If you abide in me... And my words abide in you. So now he adds that too. He says, okay, here, here's what entails abiding in me. My words abide in you. You know, Paul wrote to the Colossians, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. We are commanded to be men and women 
who not only know and study the word, but memorize the word. That we hide it in our hearts. That it's, it's, it's written upon our minds. And he says, so if you abide in me and my words abide in you, listen to this. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Wow. Wow. That's astounding. Now, of course, he's not saying, I'm going to answer every single one of your prayers. What he's saying is, fruitful Christians, believers who are abiding in Christ and obeying him, the Lord is attentive to their prayer. The Lord is attentive to their prayer. And we'll go back to that thought as when we go back to Psalm 91. But he says this in, in, in verse 8, and I'll say this in closing at, at, this, at this part. He says, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. What's our, our new slogan for this church? The subtitle is for the glory of God. That's what we're about. We're here to bring God glory. In fact, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the first question is, what is man's chief end? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Our chief end is to bring God glory, as believers especially. And we do that by abiding in Christ and bearing fruit for it because God gets the glory for that. Because it's of God. But going back to what I was saying about prayer, that he, that God is attentive to the prayer of the righteous, we'll skip down to verse 14 of Psalm 91, and then we'll go back to where we were, because listen to, listen to these words. This is, this is the psalmist directly quoting God. So obviously all scripture is the word of God, but there are specific portions where it is actually God speaking, and it's put in quotations. If you look at verse 14, the quote starts, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he knows my name. Listen to this, verse 15. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. That's the promise of God to us, brethren. If we are abiding in Christ, we are walking in obedience to Him. If we're denying self, if we are men and women of prayer and the study of the Word, and we are disciplining ourselves for the purpose of godliness and bearing fruit and bringing God glory for that, then God promises intimacy and closeness that when we call on Him, He will answer us. The scripture says God does not hear the prayers of the unrighteous. You know, every time we see a tragedy in the world, and we see a, a big movement of people, uh, for example, I'll, I'll just give an example of it, really, to be, to be, uh, to be better. Remember the Paris attacks? It was uh, over a year ago now. And they're still having attacks in Europe because of the whole the migrant crisis. But nonetheless, they had those attacks. You remember the whole big campaign, Pray for Paris? And then they had the attacks a couple months ago in, uh, in England at that, that uh, concert. Then they did pray for, I uh, forgot the name of the city it was in, pray for this, that certain city. Then they had the Brussels, Brussels attacks a while back. And then they had a big campaign, pray for Brussels. You notice, and, and all these pagan people share it, pray and send them positive vibes, positive thoughts. But they'll always say that. They'll always say, pray, I'm praying, I'm praying. What are you, who, what, who are you praying to? And what are you praying for? Certainly, the God of heaven and earth does not hear their prayer. That's just, that's the fact and reality of it. Ungodly people, God does not hear their prayer. Pagan idolaters, God doesn't hear their prayer. People who are walking in total rebellion to God, God does not hear them when they pray. But believers, we have direct, in fact, Scripture says, I love what Ephesians says, says, for we have access to God through Christ in one spirit. That's beautiful. What, a, what a, a, a unity between the Trinity. So we have access to the Father through Christ in the Spirit. The Spirit gives us the grace to walk through Christ into the Father. That we have that ability to enter in. Just as I, when I, when I was just praying a minute ago and just thanking the Father that we have that privilege. Because it's such a privilege. These people out in the world, even in Lawrence County, who are not Christians, who are not born again, they don't have access to God. They are cut off from God, Scripture says. Separated from the life of God. Separated from the presence of God. They're cut off. When they call out for prosperity, they call out for a sick family member, or they call out for themselves, God doesn't hear them. The only prayer God will hear for the ungodly is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the, only, the prayer of salvation. Or as, as it's, the term may be dubbed, and 
This term is a little confusing sometimes. But the sinner's prayer, the prayer of the sinner who is contrite and crying out for mercy. Then that's the only prayer God hears. The prayer for mercy. But going back up to verse 5, we'll just go through these, these selected verses here a little bit faster in closing. He says in verse 5, He will not be afraid of the terror by night. We'll be brave. We'll have bravery to stand against life's trials. Why? Because we're abiding in the Lord. We're near to Him. We're near to the one who controls everything. What's, what's, the, what's the matter? Why are we worried? He says, Or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. Verse 7, A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. Wow. He's saying, all you, all your family, all your friends, everyone near you could perish. But the Lord will not forsake you. The Lord will be with you. Why? Because Jesus Christ, as Hebrews 13 says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is immutable. In other words, and that, that's a very simple word. It's a theological term, but it's, it's very simple because whenever we have music too loud in the car or on the, the, the computer, we just turn it down. We mute it. We suppress it, and Christ is immutable. He is, you cannot suppress him. He's unchanging, and he's always the same. That's how we can stand. And verse 8, he says, you will, look, or you will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. In other words, they're going to get judgment. Verse 9, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bury you up on their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Whew. That's astounding. And that's what Scripture says. When Christ returns, when this life is, is over and, and Christ sets up His kingdom, we will reign with Him, Scripture says, forever and ever. Our enemies, you know, I think, I've, I've, I've been through trials in my life, obviously, even as a believer, and there have been people who have set themselves up against me, tried to slander me. And we've all experienced them for people who have brought upon us trouble, unspeakable pain, even some of us. We can trust that God is just, and he will, as verse 8 says, we will look on our eyes and we will see the recompense of the wicked. In other words, in other words we will see the fact that they will be judged one day. God will administer justice. We can rest in that. In fact, uh, if you recognize the words there when I read verse uh, 11 and verse 12, who quoted that in the New Testament? Who quoted verse 11 and 12? It was none other than... Satan himself quoted these words to the Lord Jesus in Matthew 4. When Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days, he's tempted. In uh, Matthew 4, it, it records that Satan takes Jesus up onto the pinnacle of the temple. He says, throw yourself down, and then he misapplies an Old Testament verse. He takes scripture out of context. And he quotes, obviously that's not what the psalmist is saying. In the context of this verse, he's not saying that God's going to, if we jump off a building, God's going to help us off. You know, God's going to keep us from hitting the ground. In fact, uh, it's kind of funny. When you really start to think about what the devil was saying, the devil was a prosperity gospel preacher. Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, if, if, you're, if you're truly the son of God, if you're truly blessed, throw yourself off this building. God won't let you get hurt. Because look, the text says it. But in context, that's not what he's saying. It's not what the psalmist is saying. And that, that's, that's a beautiful sign. Well, not a beautiful sign, but a, a, a very good sign for us to see when someone is a false teacher, they misapply Scripture. They take it out of its context. For Satan himself did that. We always read Scripture in its context. So in verse 14, in closing of this chapter, again, as we just read, the Lord, he's quoted here as saying, Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. If I could dub, or I, if I could give these, these last three verses a title, it would just be intimacy. 
nearness. I think a lot of times we use the term intimacy and we think of sexual intimacy. But the word just simply means closeness. You're near to someone. You can be in, intimate uh, towards someone in a totally platonic manner. And that is precisely what intimacy with God is. It's not intimacy in that way. It's a platonic intimacy. And it's, it's just a nearness with God. And the benefits, I mean, uh, he, I mean, I could go through and, and just, I could preach a whole sermon on each of these promises God gives. How he hears our prayer, he delivers us from trouble, he, he honors us, not in the sense that he praises us, but he honors our faith in him. With a long life, he says he will satisfy us. What's he, what's he talking about? We're going to have a long life? We're going to live a long life here? I'm talking about eternal life. See, it's, it's beautiful because the original recipients of these Old Testament, or the original readers of the Old Testament books, would have read these truths and, and they would have been encouraged. But now in the New Covenant, when we look at the Old Testament through the eyes, through the lens of the New Covenant, it, is, it takes on so much more meaning. God's not just promising some generic prosperity. He's promising eternal life. And that's why at the end of verse 16 he says, And I will let him see my salvation. Who is the salvation of the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll, go, I'll say these words in closing. If you'll go with me to 1 John 3. 1 John. 1 John is really close to the end of the Bible. In 1 John 3. So we will see the salvation of the Lord. Well, what does he mean by that? In verse 3, listen to what John says. He says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God? And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. We praise God for that. Brethren, let us discipline ourselves. Let us deny self. Let us walk with the Lord. Practice the disciplines of grace. Draw near to our gracious God because he has set his, his abounding eternal love on us. As verse 1 of this chapter says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Fathers, loving fathers, want to be near to their children. And God, being perfect in love, desires nearness and intimacy with his saints, with his holy ones. And if you are not near to the Lord in the sense that you know you're unconverted, then you can draw near to God through Christ. As this verse says in verse 3, that you set your hope on him, you'll be pure. You'll be purified. You'll be cleansed from your sin. For the scripture says that we have sinned and we deserve hell, but God sent Christ to die and to rise again. That is the love of God manifested. That's the love of God displayed. And that's the ultimate motive for drawing near to God because He has so loved us. We draw near to God because He has brought Himself into a right standing with us. He has, he has brought His salvation to us. That's the ultimate motive. Gratitude. Gratitude. Because God has given us riches in Christ. For all who repent and believe are not only forgiven, but wrapped in the righteousness of Christ eternally. And that's where we stand before God, brethren. We don't have to be fearful or anxious of approaching God, with the, even though we know that we're sinners and we fall short, because we are in Christ. We are in Him. God sees us as if we lived Christ's life, because He saw Christ as having lived our sinful life. The precious great exchange of the gospel. And you will be saved if you believe it. So in closing, in conclusion, I should say, we've seen here that nearness with God, intimacy with God, abiding in God has so many wonderful benefits. So many. In fact, every reason in the world to abide in Christ. And there's every reason in the world for that. Because it is the right thing we ought to do. God desires us. He's inviting us to be near to Him. So let us draw near to Him with a sincere conscience through faith in our mediator, Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I ask that you'd give us grace to deny self daily and to walk in holiness and purity and to put into practice the disciplines of grace.
to be men and women who draw near to you, Lord. Father, I pray for that. I pray if any of anybody who hears these words are unconverted, that you would convert them, that you would draw them near to you. For we know the Lord Jesus said that no one can come to you unless, or no one can come to Christ unless you draw him first. So we ask that you would do that for your own glory and for the glory of Christ Jesus. We praise you, O oh God, for your love you set upon us. Father, may we draw near to you, not because we have to or even because we're commanded to, but because we desire. We desire it. We desire intimacy with the God who so loved the world. It's in Christ's name we pray, and through Christ we pray. Amen.